So, there are probably very few of you who would be surprised by this, uh, but on most personality tests, I generally fall toward the extroverted end of the introversion-extroversion scale. No surprises, correct? In fact, in one assessment that I took, I, I've taken many of these at various times, uh, I was supposed to sit down with a psychologist afterwards who was going to discuss the results and sort of process, process them with me. Uh, and this is what she said. The majority of people fall within a certain range of extrovert, introvert, introvert on the scale. It, it turns out that I fall beyond <laughs> the normal range of what they call normal extroversion. She then described for me what they call extreme extroversion, which is the small fraction of people who fall beyond the normal range. Then she said, there is a tiny fraction of the population that falls beyond extreme extroversion. This is me, more or less. The psychologist then spent some time to, uh, explaining with me what this might mean for my life and for ministry in general. And she told me that extroversion can be an asset, but she also wanted to make very clear that it could be a huge liability. Th that if I wasn't careful, if I'm not careful, if I'm not intentional, I will never develop real or deep connections with other people. That if I'm not careful and intentional, all of my relationships will exist and stay at a surface level. And she said this, if you settle for that, you will live a lonely and highly unstable life. Awesome. And when I'm honest about my life and about my friendships through the past, I can see the real truth in what she, she told me. Uh, I've, I've been in weddings throughout the years, but I've never been somebody's best man. And at 21, when I got married, uh, of my closest friends, those who I asked to be in my wedding, I, I couldn't or I wouldn't have called any of them my, my best friend or best man. And, and other than a few friendships that were held together up till that point, mostly by just the sheer number of years that we had known each other, the majority of my, what I would have called friendships, were a mile wide and an inch deep. And, and, I, and I point this out to just make clear that community is not something that comes natural to me. It's not something that comes easy. And covenant, definitely not. In fact, it really is something that I naturally uh, war against. I naturally resist taking the time to know people and to really be known by them. And I have this natural aversion to all forms of commitment. It's easy and it's common for us to look at ourselves and to say things like, well, here I am. This is just who I am take it or leave it. For me, that would mean saying, I don't do community, deep connections, they're just not my thing. But over the years, I, I've had to wrestle with, I've had to consider honestly whether I would be okay with the consequences of avoiding these kinds of connections. Could I be content with a life filled with all kinds of social activity and parties, lots of people, and yet a life that still ends in loneliness? Could I be content to live without any sort of relational roots, leaving me susceptible to, to sort of float dangerously, independently, wherever I pleased? Can I live a faithful life for God if I remain isolated and refuse to commit myself to others. Uh, there have been passages of scripture throughout the years that have consistently uh, called out to me 
challenging me time and again to give myself more fully to others, to give myself more fully for the sake of others, to a life of community, to a life of covenant. And one set of these passages are found in the First Testament books, First and Second Samuel. So if you turn there with me to First Samuel and we'll start at chapter 18. Uh, these aren't just single passages, but these are really a series of connected narratives that are, that are broken up by other stories, but are part of this, this large story of Israel's first kings. And where we're going to start in chapter 18, we're going to find three figures who have this bizarrely twisted sort of relational dynamic. And I want to introduce these figures to you. You may be incredibly familiar with them and you may not have ever heard of, heard of them. And so I want to just give a quick summary of who they are. First, we have the very first king of Israel, a man named Saul, who said to stand a head taller than everyone else. Saul has been told that his reign as king is coming to an end at this point in the story. He has failed to be a faithful king. And Saul is no longer filled with God's spirit. And Saul, as a result of being told that he would lose his kingdom, is now clinging to it with his every last breath. Then there's Jonathan. Jonathan, the would-be successor to Saul's throne. Jonathan, the son of Saul, should have been the next king. He was in line. You knew that he was going to be king. When Saul is told, you're not going to be king anymore, Jonathan is left saying, wait, that was going to be mine. This is Jonathan. And then we have David. Little more at this point in the story than a, a, a young shepherd who, who has been a servant of Saul's. But David has just accomplished a feat that really is the feat of kings. He has defeated through impossible odds an enemy, a great enemy of Israel, the great Goliath. David has done what kings do. Saul and Jonathan don't know it yet, or they don't seem to as the story uh, leads us to believe. But, but just as the end of Saul's kingdom has been announced, the beginning of David's has also been proclaimed. And so you have a lame duck king and a former heir to the throne and a servant boy doing the stuff of kings. How will these relationships play out? And that's where we open, where we start. Chapter 18, verse 1. As soon as David had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day and would not let took David that day and would not let him return to his father Jesse's house. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of his royal robe that was on him and gave it to David and his armor and even his sword and his bow and his belt. And David went out and was successful wherever Saul sent him, so that Saul set him over the men of war. And this was good in the sight of all of the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. Last week, we explored the idea that the church is not an ordinary community. Rather, the, the church is a community that's bound by a covenant. Here, Jonathan makes a covenant with David. Recall some of the language that maybe you're familiar with, but maybe not. Maybe this will first, be the first time you've heard it. The language that the Apostle Paul uses to describe his connection with men and women at churches all over the Roman Empire. He says stuff like this, and we find in Philippians, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all of my prayers for all of you, I am always rejoicing. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you because I have you 
in my heart. It is the affection of Christ Jesus that I have for you. Jonathan and David seem to have this type of deep connection. Jonathan, as we read, loves David. He loves David. His supposed rival. This is who David is supposed to be. David is is the one who's supposed to take the throne. He's supposed to be his rival to the throne. He becomes his family's enemy. Jonathan loves his family's enemy as he loves himself. And because of this internal commitment that he has to David, he makes an external or a public display of this commitment. He makes a covenant. And we get almost zero details about what this covenant looks like. Did they sacrifice animals to make this covenant? That was pretty typical. Did they go through any of the other rituals that you would go through when you would establish a covenant with somebody? Or did they just spit it in their hands and shake on it? Or have you guys ever seen, uh, is it my girl, where they pick scabs and like rub the blood together? <laughs> that was an awesome groan from a region over there. I mean, how, how did they establish? We don't know. We don't know how they made it, and we don't really know what it includes. Uh, covenants always involve some sort of promise between two people toward each other, or more people, uh, but we don't hear any of these, just that a covenant was made. And then, Jonathan starts randomly giving away all of his stuff. He gives away his royal robe to David. He gives away his armor and his weapons to David. Jonathan, who just in a couple stories before, is only one of two people in the entire kingdom who owns a sword. He gives that to David. His servant. He's giving away his royal possessions. Covenants always cost us something, don't they? When we make promises to each other about how we're going to live with one another, uh, when we establish these bonds with another person, we, we always have to give up some degree of our autonomy, our independence for the sake of the other person or the community that we're covenanting with. The covenant that Jonathan is making with David is from all appearances a covenant that is going to cost him his throne. Being a covenant participant in the church is going to cost us something. In some ways, that something is the same for each of us. We all have the same call on our lives to be servants, to serve one another. But in other ways, the cost will be different. The cost will be unique to us based on what we have. Perhaps our position. As we've read the stories, as you read the stories of Jonathan and David, you quickly start to wonder from story to story to story, now what does Jonathan get out of this deal? What does Jonathan get out of this covenant? But in truth, what does David really have to offer at this point? But as you read each of the stories through 1 Samuel, Jonathan gives up his throne. Jonathan betrays his own flesh and blood, his father. Jonathan publicly advocates for David's character. Jonathan falls out of his father's inner circle. He he defends David. And he even has a spear thrown at him by his own father. All of it for David. This is how it goes for Jonathan. Again and again, Jonathan's life is given over for the sake of David. And you start to wonder whether this covenant's going to cost David anything at all. Yet it was Jonathan who, who initiated the covenant with David. And eventually, in 2 Samuel, we do find that David has the opportunity to serve Jonathan to serve the commitment that the two of them shared, the the covenant as he honors his son, Mephibosheth, or Mephibosheth, however you want to say that. I saw Derek giggling right here as he knew I was about to say it, and there are a million ways that I've heard it, and it's fascinating. Mephibosheth. Say that ten times fast. But David does. He has the chance. He serves 
Jonathan in return, and it, but it comes at the very end. He has the opportunity to return Jonathan's covenant faithfulness to do the covenant himself. But in the early stories, it's, it's all Jonathan, the should-have-been king. Jonathan, like his father, could have clung to his illegitimate power or he could make a covenant, he could covenant with the true king, the Lord's anointed for the sake of God's kingdom. See, it turns out that Jonathan's covenant with David is not actually merely about friendship. Friendship is the result. Friendship is what, what, what they come to share as a result of the covenant. But the, the purpose of the covenant has more to do with God than it does with David. It's about covenanting with God for the sake of God's plan and, and God's will to work through his anointed one. Jonathan's covenant is about giving himself to God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And we'll, we'll hear more of that in the next passage we, we come to. This covenant is more than just an idea or, or a hypothetical promise. Like, yeah, I'm committed to you. I'm committed to this thing. And it's not a magical bond. Just because we call this thing a covenant that somehow this relationship sort of magically explodes with rainbows and awesomeness. A covenant is something to be done. It is something that you do. It is something to be faithful to, to carry out. And there are several passages that develop what is this covenant that Jonathan and David have. But chapter 20 is probably the most extensive. And so we're going to look at that. Um, we're going to look at what does Jonathan do to carry out this covenant. What does it look like for covenant with God's people to be the primary relationship in your life? As you listen and read along, listen for how Jonathan does the covenant. And we'll start in verse 1 of chapter 20. Then David said before Jonathan, What have I done? What is my guilt? What is my sin before your father that he seeks my life? And he said to him, Jonathan said to David, Far from it, you shall not die. Behold, my father does nothing, either great or small, without disclosing it to me. And why should my father hide this from me? It's not so. But David vowed again, saying, Your father knows well that I have found favor in your eyes. And he thinks, Do not let Jonathan know this, lest he be grieved. But truly, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, there is a step between me and death. Jonathan here unknowingly reveals the family alienation that, it, that exists because of their connection. Jonathan and David, he has alienated his family and thus is out of the inner circle of his father's counsel. Verse 4, Then Jonathan said to David, Whatever you say, I will do for you. David then said to Jonathan, Behold, tomorrow is a new moon, and I should not fail to sit at the, at the table with the king. But let me go, that I may hide myself in the field till the third day at evening. If your father misses me at all, then say, David earnestly asked leave of me to run to Bethlehem his city, for there is a yearly sacrifice there for all the clan. And if Saul says, Good, it will be well with your servant. But if he is angry, then know that harm has been determined by him. Therefore, deal kindly with your servant. For you have brought your servant into a covenant of the Lord with you. But if there is guilt in me, kill me yourself. For why should you bring me to your father? David here appeals to the covenant that Jonathan has made with him. In, in fact, David shows us that the covenant is bigger than we may have previously imagined. It is not just a covenant between Jonathan and David. It is a covenant of the Lord. And if this is a covenant of the Lord, then David tells Jonathan, Listen, if I am unfaithful to the call of the Lord, it would be better for you to kill me. 
This isn't a covenant about David. It's, a, it's about God and it's about what God is doing, though through David. And we've already seen up to this point, Jonathan giving away his, his royal paraphernalia, he, he releasing power that, that God doesn't intend for him to have. And in the back of our minds, Saul and his relentless commitment to his lost throne, clinging to it with his every breath. Here we see David saying, listen, a throne is meaningless. To be king is meaningless if it's apart from the Lord. For Jonathan then to deal kindly with David, David suggests is to kill him if he's guilty of any sin against the Lord. When was the last time you gave somebody permission to do that? I have never. And I don't plan on it. But when was the last time you gave someone, anyone, the freedom to speak openly about the sin in your life? Perhaps to even judge it. You tend to think of judgment in negative connotation but to name it as sin. To say, this is not good, not true, not right. And, and when was the last time you allowed somebody to, to come into your life in such a way that they might actually be a means of living free from that sin? We pick up in ch- uh, verse 12. And Jonathan said to David, The Lord, the God of Israel, be witness when I have sounded out my father about this time tomorrow or the third day behold if he is well disposed toward David shall I not then send and disclose it to you but should it please my father to do you harm the Lord do so to Jonathan and more also if I do not disclose it to you and send you away that you may go in safety may the Lord be with you as he has been with my father Now, Jonathan requests whatever harm may come to David, he asks for it himself. This might remind us of last week. Remember last week, Paul's willingness uh, in our passage to to pay any and all of Onesimus' debts in order that he might be reconciled to the community, that he might become part of the covenant community. Paul said, "If, if he has anything left against him, put it on my bill, I will pay it. And here, Jonathan seems to to, in essence, do something similar. He seems to understand that what, that what God intends to do with David is big. And so he says, I'm willing to offer myself in his place for the sake of God's kingdom. Here, he even makes himself accountable by setting punishment up for himself if he fails God in this respect, if he fails David. Verse 14 If I'm still alive, show me the steadfast love of the Lord that I may not die. And do not cut off your steadfast love from my house forever. When the Lord cuts off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth, Jonathan knows what's about to happen. David is going to be king. Saul's people, his armies, those who oppose the true anointed one are going to be cut down. And Jonathan pleads for mercy according to the covenant that they've made. And Jonathan makes a covenant with the house of David saying, May the Lord take vengeance on David's enemies. And Jonathan made David swear again by his love for him. For he loved him as he loved his own soul. And here for the first time we get the sense that this is actually a mutual covenant. David now makes a promise to Jonathan. It's a promise that would be fulfilled years and years down the road. But a promise nonetheless one that David would be faithful to. What follows then is the story of David hiding and Jonathan going out to find what Saul's intentions are and this whole thing about shooting arrows. You should read it. It's interesting. Uh, But we pick up the conversation uh, between Saul and Jonathan in verse 30. Then Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan and he said said to him, This is Saul speaking to his son. You son of a perverse, rebellious woman. 
Do I not know that you have chosen the son of Jesse to your own shame and to the shame of your mother's nakedness? For as long as the son of Jesse lives on the earth, neither you nor your kingdom shall be established. Of course, it's been clear all along. Jonathan has known this, but his dad is now saying it outright. This has been the point of Jonathan's covenant. He is giving up his throne by covenanting with David. Therefore, send and bring him to me, for he shall surely die. 32. Then Jonathan answered Saul, his father, Why should he be put to death? What has he done? Here he advocates for him. But Saul hurled his spear at him to strike him. So Jonathan knew. Because it took a spear flying at him to know this for sure. But he knew that his father was determined to put David to death. And Jonathan rose up from the table in fierce anger and he ate no food the second day of the month for he was grieved for David because his father had disgraced him. So after the scene in the dining hall between Saul and Jonathan, Jonathan goes out to the field and he follows the plan to warn David. And the two then get this final chance to speak face to face and we hear those words. As soon as the boy had gone, David rose from beside the stone heap and fell on his face to the ground and he bowed three times and they kissed one another and wept with one another. David weeping the most. Then David said to, Jonathan said to David, Go in peace because we have sworn both of us in the name of the Lord, saying, The Lord shall be between us, me and you, and between my offspring and your offspring forever. And he rose and departed. And Jonathan went into the city. Depending on your familiarity with the New Testament, you should recognize a lot of this. The way that Jonathan does covenant with David should remind us of the things that we hear Jesus telling his disciples and the things that we read Paul telling uh, the churches that he serves to do. Love your neighbor, love your brother, love your sister, love your enemy as yourself. You're to submit to one another, you're to serve one another, you're to encourage one another, speaking, each of you, on behalf of one another's character. You're to prioritize your covenant loyalties over blood relations. You are to seek first the kingdom of God. Jonathan, in a very real respect, is David's church. The story that you read through 1 Samuel seems to suggest that Jonathan's friendship and covenant with David, they're not this superficial side note like, oh, that's like a nice little interjection along the way. Like you have all of this like meanness from Saul and then Jonathan's the nice one. Uh, just to, to counteract it or whatever. It, no, this, this is part of the story. This covenant is central in David's growth. It's, it's central in his development as a servant king. David seems to learn the kind of king that he is supposed to be through this relationship with Jonathan. I, I told you earlier that I don't do community naturally, let alone covenant. But it is something that I have had to learn and I am still (laughs) working to learn but when I began to open myself up to the possibility of developing deep and meaningful friendships I read passages like this assuming I was David right I began to wait for a Jonathan to come along and covenant with me I had decided okay I'm willing. I'm willing to go deep. As Brian Campiotti calls it, a level five relationship. Uh, I was willing, right? But I wanted someone to initiate it. I wanted someone else to make the first move. I wanted someone else to risk something of them first, of themselves first so that I could say, okay, okay, I'm in two. A- at the beginning of the year, Many of you read our our annual report where, as part of it, I described our church's uh, desire to be a a deep and real community. And in that annual report, I described the, the, the truth that everyone wants it. 
This is the, the most common thing we say when we talk about what kind of church are we going to be or should we be a, a covenant. Or, sorry, we, we want community. But, but it seems as though while we all want it, we're all sort of waiting for someone else to make the effort, right? Uh, we, who wants to pay the price up front until you know that somebody else is going to make equal, equal or greater effort? And, and sometimes we're even so busy that we don't even notice the effort that others are making around us. And it's this insane and vicious cycle that ends up leaving us more and more isolated. So, so last week I asked everyone to respond to two questions, to send them to me, to write them on the blue communication card in your worship folder, or to email it or text it or however you want to communicate with me, but get them to me. The first question was, how are you to do covenant with the church? And the second one is, how are we to do covenant with the church? And I got two responses. So maybe, like me, covenant doesn't come naturally to you either. Nor covenant. But the good news is that through Jesus, the Messiah, by His death and His resurrection, we have been made into a new people. His people. His church. God has chosen to use, for some reason, local churches as the means by which He makes us His holy people. This means that, that our choice to invest ourselves in each other's lives is, is less about what it might be for us, the ways that it might satisfy us or, or fulfill our relational needs, that somehow our choice to invest in each other's lives, to do covenant with each other, is, is about God's kingdom. That somehow this choice is about letting God use us so that, that we might give our lives for others so that they might become who God intends them to be. Like Jonathan and David, the way that we live our lives together, the way that we do covenant will either suggest that God and His work are the most important things in our lives and in our world, or the way that we live our lives together will say that our comfort, our pleasure, or whatever else are the most important things in our lives and in our world. But the truth is, in Christ, in the Messiah, we belong to each other. We are bound together by this new covenant. God has proven over and over again His ability to be faithful to His covenants. And so now He invites us to walk by His Spirit that we might too walk in covenant faithfulness with Him and with the people that He has given to us to walk with. And so how will we do covenant For our reflection this morning, I, I just want to ask two questions. Maybe some of you thought about it, you just didn't turn in the turn in a paper or whatever. Um, what does it look like for us to do covenant? And then the second question is, where have you seen people doing covenant? I'll give you a second to think about that. What does it look like to do covenant? And that would be an answer from last week. And where have you seen people doing covenant? The covenant people of God, may we walk in His grace and in His truth and in His strength. Go, grace and peace.